Joseph de Mestre. Excerpted from Recognitions. Julius Avola. 1974. Narrated by Skeptical Waves. A new edition of Joseph de Mestre's St. Petersburg Dialogues, edited by Alfredo Cattabiani, has recently been published. This is Mestre's best-known work, in it, however, Mestre's political references, for which Mestre accounts as a reactionary, are scarcer than in others of his writings. Indeed here we find above all considerations on moral and religious problems, and the very subtitle of the book, Discussions on the Temporal Government of Providence indicates this line of thought, which for us does not generate any great interest. Presupposing precisely the existence of a providence conceived in moralizing terms, Mestre confronts the problem of reconciling this providence with the spectacle that the world and history in their reality present us, wickedness which goes unpunished, virtue which has no recompense, and so on. One cannot say that the solutions which Mestre proposes to this problem are entirely convincing. However Mestre is not brought to a redimensioning or an amplification of his concept of divinity in the terms we have indicated in our previous essay on the left-hand path. The idea of a divine justice which would procrastinate only in its sanctions seems to us somewhat makeshift. As its basis, Mestre translated a tract of Plutarch in the appendix of his book, a tract entitled precisely De Sera Numinis Vindicta. However the same Mestre offers a freer and more satisfying view when he compares the evils and the contingencies which reign on the entire human race to bullets which strike an army in war, and which make no distinction between the good and the wicked. One must believe that a being, acquiring the human state of existence, wanting it, either thoughtlessly, or out of temerity, as has been said in a hermetic tract, cannot help but find itself exposed to the contingencies proper to such a state. One might naturally be brought to search for transcendent moral nexuses in either case, but this retains ever the character of reckless hypothesis. But leaving this order of problems aside, we move on to mention certain ideas of Mestre which are interesting from the traditional point of view. In the first place, we might indicate the idea of a primordial tradition. It may be that Mestre owes this to Claude de Saint-Martin, whom he knew and who was an exponent of esoteric doctrines, ever in the framework of masonry, which at that time was much different than now, so much so that even Mestre participated in it. We might also indicate Mestre's thesis that the natural originating state of humanity was not a barbaric state. On the contrary, it was a state of light and of knowledge, while the wild man, the presumed primitive, was only the descendant of a man detached from the great tree of civilization, following a malfeasance which cannot be repeated. But in other respects man finds himself feeling the effects of a malfeasance and of a consequent degradation, caused not only by his spiritual and intellectual but also by his physical, vulnerability. Such an idea is evidently similar to that of the original sin of the Christian mythology, though the framework is wider and more acceptable. As for the aforementioned thesis on the true nature of the primitives, it has the potential of carrying ethnologic research to a higher level, and preserving the same research from many blunders. Mestre indicts the savants, scientists and their like who, as if in conspiracy, do not admit that one may know more than them, or in a different way than they do. One judges a time in which men saw effects and causes by the mentality of a time in which men struggle to rise from effects to causes, or in which one says it is useless to occupy oneself with causes, or in which one almost does not even know what a cause is. He adds, one hears endless rubbish about the ignorance of the ancients who saw spirits everywhere, to me it seems that we are much more foolish than they because we do not see spirits anywhere. We hear talk always of physical causes. But what, in the end, is a physical cause? For him the axiom that no physical event regarding man can have a higher cause is inauspicious, and promotes a fundamental superficiality. Mestre negates the idea of progress. Regression appears considerably more plausible to him. He observes that myriad traditions attest that men have commenced with science, but with a different science than our own, superior to it, because it departed from the heights, which rendered it at the same time very dangerous. And this explains why science, in its beginnings, was ever mysterious, and remained closed in the sphere of the temples, where in the end it was extinguished, when this flame no longer served for anything other than to burn. Mestre strongly emphasized prayer in its power. He wrote in the end, No one can prove that a nation which prays is not fulfilled but it is really the opposite which one must demonstrate, and this is not easy. One finds oneself standing before the antithesis between prayer and the virtue that one attributes to it on the one hand, and the immutability of the laws of nature on the other antithesis which Mestre seeks to get to the bottom of, in a way which is, however, little convincing. He holds that if prayers are not granted, this is owed only to a higher divine wisdom. Mestre's apologia of the executioner as instrument of God is often cited as though it were scandalous, and also his conception of the divine character of war. 
Unfortunately in this last connection he does not consider that war might bring about heroism and super-individual actions, but he sees it in the gloomy terms of an expiation which strikes a fundamentally guilty and degraded humanity. The difference between just war and unjust war, between a war of defense and a war of conquest, between a victorious war and a lost war, is not considered. These are views which little accord with a positively reactionary orientation. In another of his works, Consideration sur la France, Mestre, while declaring himself for a restoration, enunciates an important concept by saying that the counter-revolution must not be a contrary revolution but rather the contrary of revolution. To him one owes a kind of theology of revolution, he brings to light the demonic aspect which generally conceals itself in the revolutionary phenomenon. Such an aspect is observable also in the fact that revolution sweeps its artificers away, rather than letting itself be truly guided by them, and often crushes them in the process. Only in the modern epoch do we find the phenomenon of a more or less institutionalized permanent revolution, with its technicians and its lucid manipulators. In St. Petersburg dialogues, leaving apart certain disquisitions, for example Mestre's prolix analysis of Locke, the reader might glean many other interesting points. We shall not resist the temptation to relate Mestre's comment on woman, woman cannot be superior save as a woman, but from the moment she emulates man, she becomes naught but a monkey. This is pure truth, whether or not it pleases various contemporaneous feminine movements.